Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. Today, I'm super excited to chat with our guest, Catherine Price. Catherine is a science journalist and author of the book, How to Break Up with Your Phone. Thanks for coming on for a chat. Thank you for having me. So before we get into the nitty gritty, practical implications, all that good stuff, what originally inspired you to write a book about our mobile devices? I think the short answer is I started to become more aware of my own use of my device, in particular around my then newborn baby, where I noticed an increasing number of times where I would find her looking at me and I was looking down at my phone. And that that made me feel very bad (laughs) as a person. Mm -hmm. And not just in terms of the effect it might have on her as a baby, but also on the effect it was having, or about the effect it was having on my experience as a person and mother, that I wanted to be present in this moment. And instead I was looking through eBay for things like antique doorknobs, which is not really a useful use of your time, regardless of what life stage you're in. And I also have a background. I'm a health and science journalist by profession, and I've done a lot of work with mindfulness. And so I already was kind of primed to come at this from the question of what does this mean about how I'm actually spending the moments of my lives and what impact could it be having on me is my my hunch that things like a weekend detention span or Uh, difficulty remembering things, could that actually be due to my phone in some ways? I was really curious about that question. And yeah, it didn't take long before I realized this is a real thing. And it's not just me. It's not just my husband who are dealing with it. It's everybody. It's just that we haven't really started talking about it yet. Absolutely. I love that. What exactly does it mean to you to break up with our phones? Why did you sort of title the book that way? And why should folks be interested in doing so? Well, breaking up with your phone does not mean throwing your phone out. So that's an important point to get across right at the beginning of any conversation about this. It's about creating a healthier relationship with your phone. So you can think about it as going from an obsessive romance with your phone where you're craving it and thinking about it all the time. It can't bear to be apart to just being friends with your phone or to just having a healthier relationship. You can keep it romantic if you want. I don't care. But just having a healthier relationship where you spend time together because you actually want to and because you have decided it's a good use of your time and attention rather than because you've been manipulated by an app maker who has developed a product deliberately meant to keep you using it for as long as possible. And why should people care? Oh, there's many reasons they should care. I mean, if you have any hunch about what your screen time might be doing to you, you're probably right. (laughs) There probably actually is something behind it. It's not all in your head. What I discovered in my research is that our phones really are having effects on a wide range of of parts of our daily lives from our emotional health and our relationships to our memories and ability to focus, um, definitely attention spans and sleep, which it's on its own is a huge, huge problem. So there are many reasons to be concerned about the way that we're interacting, interacting with our devices, the least of which, not the least of which is also just as how we experience our lives. We're spending an average of about four hours a day with the screens on, not like listening to a podcast when it's off with the screen on. And that's if you have a 16 hour day, a quarter of your waking life you're spending on your phone. So I think that number alone should inspire people to think a bit more critically about whether that's what they want to be doing with their time. Yeah, I heard a stat recently that the average person checks their phone or looks at their phone 200 plus times per day, which is mind boggling when you think about it. And then I guess that translates into four hours of screen time. Is that an average or how does that look? The four hours a day is from an app called Moment that's a a time tracking app. And that has nearly 5 million downloads, so it's a large sample size. The N is much larger than one. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so that I feel confident using the four hours a day of of screen time there. And I find it horrifying, again, that it's just the screen. Um, In terms of the checks, that I just, I think it's really hard to quantify. The number I have in the book is 82, but every time I see that, I think that has to be too low. Maybe for teenagers and then 47 for other people. So. You see that all over the place, but it really depends on what you're doing with your phone. You could spend the four hours just uh, using, you know, three sessions of an app, or you could be be checking just for seconds at a time over and over and over again. So it depends on what type of use you do. But one of the nice things about uh, time tracking apps like Moment is it'll actually show you when you have your pickups so you can see when the times of day are that you tend to reach for it the most. Okay, very cool. So there's been this huge spike, obviously, in our cell phone usage recently. So 
you alluded to this a little bit, but what are some of the impacts on our brains that we know about and things like memory formation, which you alluded to as well? Well, there's a lot of different ways that they're affecting us. The, the one that really stood out to me was the distraction thing, because as I was saying, I just felt so distracted when I first started this project. And I have this page from my journal that I keep meaning to scan so that I can use it in talks about this, where I'm brainstorming what became the book. And it reads like I have an attention disorder because it's like three sentences about one thing, then another thought, there's an arrow across the page to another thing. There's an admission in the middle of it that I went online and bought three sports bras on Amazon. And there's like no <laughs> mention of anything sports related or bra related anywhere in these surrounding paragraphs. So I, I, I was very interested in that question. And what I came to discover is basically that our brains are designed to be distractible. We actually really want to be distractible because that's how you stay alive in nature. You want to notice something moving in the periphery because that something could be an animal that wants to eat you or, you know, some kind of threat. So distraction actually is, is our default state. It's not just kind of a neutral, we're not in a neutral beginning spot. When you spend your life and your education learning how to do things like read books and stay focused on one thing, that's a highly unnatural thing for your brain to do. And therefore, something that you really should be very protective of. And it's very much similar to how it's much easier to get out of shape than it is to get into and maintain, you know, being in shape. So I realized that the particular type of stimulation that we're getting when we use our phones, this kind of repeated intense distraction, is actually training us. It's like having a personal trainer to become just more distractible or a personal trainer who got you to be, you know, got you to just sit on the couch all day. And so we really are seeing an impact on our attention spans, our ability to concentrate as this response in the way that we're interacting with our phones. And this, of course, depends upon the fact, which I should have mentioned earlier, that our brains are plastic. They're constantly changing. They're constantly, they're very malleable, and they're constantly changing in response to stimuli. So that means you should be pretty conscious and uh, questioning about what sorts of stimulation you're subjecting your brain to, especially if you're doing it for four hours a day, because anything that you do for four hours a day is going to change your brain. And in this case, I don't think it's doing particularly good things. And then, you know, our brain, our phones are having effects on our memory, which is a big deal. <laughs> you feel like you <laughs> just matters. can't remember anything. Right. But even uh, in an interesting way that I hadn't thought of before I started this project, it's not just like ability to remember things. It's the ability to actually store the memories and experiences that you have and to process them and to draw connections between seemingly disparate things which to me is the definition of an insight. But your brain needs to have undistracted kind of quiet time to be able to actually create the new proteins necessary in the, to create what are called schemata, these interwoven webs of information, which really are the font of creativity. So to me, that's even more profound than the distractibility thing, or maybe equally profound. You're not going to be able to focus long enough to have a creative thought, but you're also not giving your brain the space it needs to create the physical connections necessary to allow you to have insights and creative, you know, creativity at all. Um, and then also, I mean, I, I mean, I can go on. There's many other effects, but one thing I think we underappreciate that is just incontrovertible is sleep. We stay up later than we intend with our phones. And sleep, the lack thereof, has been linked definitively to all sorts of negative health, health outcomes, not just like memory and focus, which it does affect, but increasing risks of everything from cancer to, di to type 2 diabetes uh, to heart disease to stroke. It's really a crazy amount of things that are affected when you have too little sleep. And I'm not talking about all-nighters, about like a, getting an hour or two less than you need over a sustained period of time, which I would argue that our phones do for many of us. Absolutely. I'm super passionate about the sleep piece. And I think I've had three or four episodes of my podcast and like 30 just des just um, designated to sleep itself. And so it's so, so important. And it's tough to separate all that out as far as, you know, how the phone is impacting sleep itself, but then stimulating us to keep us awake. And then how, you know, just the downstream effects of it are, are massive. 
massive. Well, it's interesting to me. Yeah, I just read uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, so I'm also particularly yeah. in a sleep mode right now, and I also really like sleep. But uh, it's interesting in terms of the conversations I have about phones and that a lot of people will say, well, where are the brain scans showing how our brains have changed its response to using the phone so much? And of course, in many cases, they don't, don't, don't exist because no one thought to have a controlled group of people who never had a smartphone and then track them over time. You don't have a control group. We're all part of this massive ex experiment. Um, but if you're really, really one of those people who to think that you need to have that data in order to believe that there's any negative effect uh, from the screen time, then I think that sleep is the easiest way to say, well, okay, you cannot believe any of the other stuff I just said, but sleep in one hour a night for a week, just staying up too late, looking at the news or Twitter or whatever, you are increasing your risk for all these other things. Well, when we're checking our phones before bed, it's not just we're spending the amount of time we're spending on our phones, although that's certainly important, but it's the stuff we're doing on our phones. It's the emotionally charged content of looking at Twitter or the news or interacting with people or texting or checking our work email, whatever it may be. We're not doing, we're most likely not listening to like recordings of ocean waves or <laughs> meditating or something. We're doing something that's going to make us stay up. And then worse, or equally bad, is that we are often in many, it, it, then being woken up in the middle of the night with notifications, or go to the bathroom and then just check one thing on your phone, and that gets you out of the very important, I mean, all stages of sleep are important, but it's pulling you out of whatever stage that you're in, and then de degrading the quality of your sleep in that way as well. So all around, I mean, the sleep stuff is very important, I think, under-acknowledged. I totally agree. And now these these phone and app companies are super well educated in evolutionary biology and essentially what makes us tick. So they have us coming back for more and more by hitting those dopamine triggers in the brain. What are your thoughts on phone addiction and how would you say that it's classified? Well, if you define addiction as continuing to engage in a behavior even after you know that it is causing harm, then I firmly believe we are addicted to our phones, and I've spoken with numerous uh, psychiatrists dealing with addictions who kind of laugh that that's even a question. So I think we definitely are, and the reason is, as you're saying, is that our dopamine systems are being manipulated by app designers and phone designers to get us to use their products for as much time as possible because their, incentive, their incentives are very different from the user's incentives. And I'm not saying that phones and apps are bad at all. I mean, I certainly am not getting rid of my phone, and I think that they're genuine, that they're amazing. They make life easier, and they bring us together in ways. I mean, we're doing this interview, I guess, with a, <laughs> some technological issues, but we're able to see each other from afar, right? right? And, it's, and it's truly amazing. But we have to be aware that the incentives might not, not always line up. Basically, our brains are very vulnerable to being hacked by anyone who knows how to trigger the release of dopamine. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter that tells us when something is worth doing again. So if you find a berry on a bush and then you eat it and it doesn't kill you and it tastes good, you'll have a little bit of dopamine released that helps you remember where that bush is and also reminds you that eating that berry was a good thing to do. So you can see why it's very evolutionarily important and essential. It's released in response to yeah, food and sex. But what starts out as a habit can then also cross the line to an addiction. And you can also design products that are deliberately uh, designed to have triggers for dopamine to get users to engage with them in ways that they that may not actually be beneficial to them. And phones are a perfect example of this, as are slot machines. So if you think about some of the triggers for dopamine, bright colors, the contrast in colors, the, you know, the bright berry against the green leaf, it's not a coincidence that the little badge on your phone that says how many emails you have is going to be bright red and contrast against the background. The, sa the ability to make things happen, we really like that. We really like... Um, unpredictability is a strange one to be so attracted to, but that's one of the things that drives us the most crazy is not being able to predict what's going to happen and to have novelty. And those are two things, probably the most powerful ones that are baked into phone and app designs. You always find something waiting for you when you check your phone. It may be completely trivial and not worth your time or attention, but the fact that it's new and the fact that you didn't know it was coming is enough to trigger that dopamine. And once that happens, once you get this cycle established, it becomes very difficult to not be tempted to pick up your phone, even when you just see it lying on a table because your brain associates that phone with some sort of reward. And when you have a notification thrown in, that gets even worse. But then we become like Pavlov's dogs, you know, the Russian scientist who trained his dogs to drool when he, they heard a bell because he fed them 
food every time he rang a bell, and over time, they drool just with the bell. We're doing the same thing with notifications, where if you hear a notification go off or you feel that vibration in your pocket, chances are you're going to check it. And if you don't check it, you're probably not going to be paying attention, full attention to what you previously were doing because part of your brain has been so conditioned to want to check, to think there's a reward waiting for you that it will just keep thinking about it until you check. So there's really a lot of ways that you can manipulate our brain chemistry to get us to behave in ways that are not actually that good for us. Yeah. Wow. That was a a beautiful explanation. Now you're a mother. So how do you navigate this tech use with your family and what are some of the biggest shifts that you've implemented? Like does, does your child have a phone? Um, How old are they? Like how, how are you navigating this stuff? She's three and a half, so I'm happy to say she does not have a phone. Fair enough. Um, Yeah, and I only have one kid. Uh, I feel very strongly about it, though. I feel very strongly that exposing children to screens and in particular phones is not a good idea, especially when they're little. And I should take a step back and say that I know that I might sound alarmist in saying that, and it's important to acknowledge that humans have always freaked out about new technologies and thought it was going to destroy humanity, and that has never happened. So radio, TV... Uh, the internet. Actually, there was a really fascinating kaleidoscope craze in uh, England in the early 1800s where people were terrified that kaleidoscopes were going to lead to the downfall of civilization. That did not happen either. But with that said, there are ways that our phones are truly different that I think are important to point out. And one is that we have them with us at all times. You wouldn't go onto an elevator carrying your desktop computer Um, or a television set in the way that you do your phone. And then also, very importantly, our phones actually interact with us. None of these previous technologies had the ability to reach out and interrupt what we were doing and hijack our attention in the way that phones do. And as one of the leading advocates in this space, Tristan Harris from the Center for Human Technology, likes to point out your landline telephone didn't have hundreds or thousands of engineers on the other other side were able to track what you were doing on that phone and then manipulate the phone itself so that it could interrupt you and steal more of your attention. That just didn't happen. So with that said, that's why I am particularly concerned about phones and kids. And for my own daughter, what that means is that my husband and I do our best to not be on our phones around her. Uh, when we, we we use it primarily for FaceTime with her grandparents if we're going to do anything with her. We don't, there's no like games or video watching on the phone. And I think it's a good practice both for her and also for us as parents because it really forces us to be present with what we're doing with her. And sometimes that's really boring Um, or just like not that fun. I'd kind of rather be just getting a little dopamine hit by looking at the headlines or whatever. Um, But it's a good reminder that ultimately I I don't want to be just chasing dopamine all the time. I want to be having meaningful experiences. And the other thing I'd like to point out to parents is that they're really, uh, well, two things. If you get Wait, let me back up. As adults, we know that reading a book is worthwhile, that you can get something out of reading symbols off of a page. It may be really, really hard to do, but there is a wonder to it. If you're a kid, you don't really know that yet. So if you present a child with the option to just watch a video or read a book, I mean, it makes sense to want to watch the video. That's a lot more fun. So TV is, is easier than reading a book. And if you don't yet know that reading a book has any positive characteristics, you could be forgiven for wanting to default to TV. And then also just as a different aspect of it that I think is really important is just behavior um, and the ability to be patient and bored. And the fact that there really is something different about interacting with the screen, and I'm thinking of several, this is just an anecdote, several anecdotes, but I remember seeing a woman in line for lunch and her son, who was pretty small, maybe like two, was looking at a phone very contentedly in the stroller. And I thought, oh boy, when she tries to take that away, that's going to be interesting to see what happens. And she did because she was using the phone to pay. And this previously totally docile child like became an animal. He started screaming and kicking and hitting her. And that's not an isolated incident. There really is something about removing this stimulation again this goes to the question of are we addicted to our devices that really can trigger behaviors that you would not see in other contexts and i think that's something we should be aware of as parents again there's many positive uses of technology but there's also potential downsides they're not innocuous and up to this point i think many of us have assumed that technology is beneficial at best and innocuous at worst and we should be more it's kind of like dietary supplements actually we kind of assume there's no downside right but anything that's going to impact your brain in one way or your body in one way has the potential to do it in another way too. 
Yeah, there's always cost benefit. Always cost benefit. Now, um, something that I've noticed anecdotally, and you mentioned people wanting to see the studies um, based on how phones are impacting our brains. But something I've noticed anecdotally with myself, for example, is I used to be able to watch a full movie front to back, no problem. And now I noticed nowadays that I'll check my phone if there's any sort of lull or slow period in a movie that isn't as stimulating. And it kind of kind of scares me, actually. How are our phones impacting our ability to just focus for longer periods of time? I think that gets back to the distractibility thing that our brains want to be distracted. So if you have the potential to, tr- you know, check your phone in the middle of a slow scene in the movie, your brain's going to want to do it. When you do that, and you will find so- you'll find something waiting for you on the phone. Again, it might be trivial, but you'll find something. It reinforces that habit. So it's just allowing us to kind of indulge in our brain's worst instincts in a way. And you're certainly not alone. I mean, plenty of people have told me they have the same issue with can't deal with it like let alone a commercial break if those still exist but like a slow moment you're watching two screens at once you're checking your email and you're trying to look at the television so it's it's really tricky right right now touching on some of the tools that you suggest um something like the physical prompt you you talk a little bit about using a rubber band as a tool with your phone can you tell us a little bit more about that Yeah. So one of the key things for behavior change is just awareness. It's noticing that you're doing something because if you don't even notice it, how are you possibly going to change it? And with our phones, it's such an automatic behavior that it can really help to create some kind of interruption that makes us realize what we're doing. And so putting a rubber band on your phone is just a very low tech solution or idea for that. If you put a rubber band on your phone and you go to reach for your phone, your brain will be like, why is there a rubber band around my phone? <laughs> right. You know, eventually that will wear off. But for the first couple of times, you'll be like, oh, right. It's because I wanted to ask myself if I really want to use my phone right now. And I call that a speed bump, you know, a small obstacle that gets you to slow down to, to ensure that whatever you do next is by choice. You can also do that by changing your lock screen image. And I have some free images people can download at uh, phonebreakup.com, which is the book's website, that say things like, what do you want to pay attention to? Or do you really want to pick me up right now? So just little things that snap us out of our automatic habits so that we can decide if that's actually a habit we want to pursue in that moment. I love that. Now, as far as some really simple things that folks can implement you know, right now if they wanted to, how do you recommend that folks sort of you know, maybe delete some apps or disable notifications? Like, how, how do you think that people should go about that if, if they want to move in this direction? Well, first, you do need to have a bit of a philosophical soul-searching moment of asking yourself why you want to make the changes, just as a broader sense. Because if you don't know why, if you're just like, I need to use my phone less, which I hear from a lot of people, I need to spend less time on my phone. When it's like, well, why? Why do you need to do that? Because if you don't know why, then you're not going to do it. So first you need to say, figure out what it's, what it is getting in the way of. Maybe you want to be exercising more or you want to be spending more time with friends or you want to sleep better, whatever it may be. And then you actually have a reason that you want to spend less time on the phone. And I would go further and say that you should try to figure out what apps are causing you problems and really focus on those first. Um, but the two things that you just mentioned, the notifications and just deleting stuff, I highly recommend turning off as many notifications as you can to start. Those are there for the app makers, not for you. And anytime you allow a notification, you're basically allowing the phone to hijack your attention anytime there's a notification. So you should be very protective over when that's allowed. And for me, I leave the phone calls on and I leave text messages on because those are real people that I know trying to get in touch with real time. And then I leave the calendar on because that helps me not forget things. <laughs> Although, right, but I don't want to have, I don't even have email on my phone because I found that to be very distracting. I don't want news alerts. That's horrible, horrible, horrible. So, I mean, I really would just turn off everything. And then if you want, if you find that you're missing something, you can always re-enable that notification. But you're doing that because you want it, not because someone else put it there. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is just in general to come at this from the standpoint of thinking you want to make it easier to do the behaviors you want to be doing and harder to do the things you're trying to change. And once you start thinking about it that way, you can redesign your phone's home screen and your apps 
your app selection uh, along those lines. So your your home screen should only have tools on it, by which I mean things have, that have practical value or that support some habit that you're trying to uh, get into more. For example, Google Maps, you're probably not going to get sucked into Google Maps for 30 minutes, probably not <laughs> going to get sucked into Uber or your calendar, right? So on my home screen, I've got those things. I've got, and then I also have things for um, behaviors I want to be doing more of, like I have a meditation app and I have a guitar tuning app and a sign up for um, cross training classes at the gym. So I, I make it easier when I open my phone to get sucked into an activity that's actually beneficial. But on the same note, then I then I deleted all these other things that I knew were problems for me. I don't personally have that much of a problem with social media, but for many people, that's a big issue. And I recommend deleting those apps and just checking from the internet browser version, which normally sucks, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and just seeing what it feels like. You can always put it back on, but make it inconvenient. For me, um, email was the big problem, and then the news. So I took the news app off my phone, and I took email off my phone. And I've actually like done so many things, I don't think I actually could ever get email back on my phone, which is occasionally problematic. Um, but point being, I now can't do those things and I can tell it's working because sometimes I'll open up my phone and I, my brain just wants to check something. And I think that's really interesting because I've been thinking about this for more than three years and I still, you know, my brain is still a human brain. I will open my phone occasionally and feel myself want and I can feel my brain looking at those selection of apps and being like Uber, nope, weather, nope. Like, oh, there's nothing to get sucked into. Um, but I think that's that's a, a sign that it's working because then I, first of all, I'm aware of what I'm doing. And second, I'm like, okay, nothing to check here. Stop it, Catherine. You don't want to be doing this. That's so interesting you bring that up because I've had that same experience where I'll siphon through, you know, every, just look at every little thing on my phone. And it might even be the notes um, in my phone <laughs> where I've put something and then I'm like, okay, what am I really doing here? And I guess it is my brain just sort of searching for something to be stimulated by. Yeah, it's searching for stimulation and for excitement. And I think we often mistake those two things for happiness. And that's a really important distinction because dopamine gives us excitement and stimulation. But that's not the same thing as happiness. Yeah. (laughs) Totally, totally. totally. Now, I think that a, a lot of folks sort of set themselves up, and you alluded to this, but set themselves up from the beginning of the day to almost... I guess, just use their phones more or fail around their phones because they use their phone as their alarm clock. And then when they pick it up, they turn it off. It's literally in their hands and it's a lot tougher to resist at that point. So how do you recommend folks sort of start their day and set themselves up for success from the very beginning, from when they wake up each, uh, each and every day? Well, the short answer is don't use your phone as your alarm clock. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But the, um, but the the bigger point is that it's actually exactly the same idea we were just talking about in terms of your phone and its apps. It's redesigning your environment to support the habits you want to be engaging in. So we just talked about how to do that on the phone, but your environment off your phone, you should put thought into as well. So first, get rid of the do not use your phone as an alarm clock. Get a standalone alarm clock. You can get one for like $2. You might even have one already. But as you were pointing out, you're guaranteeing that the phone will be the first thing you touch in the morning if it is your alarm clock. And once you think about it that way, you'll start to realize, oh, wait, that that could be a very easy, I mean, I'm a hack, if you will, that actually can have a big impact is just don't don't use it as your alarm clock. But I think what often we forget is that you need to replace, we're talking about triggers essentially, right? Like triggers for habits. If you remove a, a negative trigger, like getting that phone out of your bedroom, you need to make sure to put a positive trigger in. Because if you don't, you're just going to go right back to the the habitual behavior because it's easier. So in other words, if you say, I'm not going to use my phone as the alarm clock, I've got a separate alarm clock, but my phone is still on my bedside table, you're probably going to turn off the alarm clock, the separate alarm clock, and then pick up your phone. You need to get the phone out of the bedroom for the whole night. And then this is really important. You need to put something there in its place. That is something you want to be doing. So if you say you want to be reading more, there's something in particular you want to read, put a book on your bedside table so that when you go to instinctively reach for the phone before bed, you encounter the book. And we're just so lazy. Like people are so lazy. Like we don't even want to get out of bed to turn off the light. So if your phone is all the way in the kitchen (laughs) charging and you are there and you know, you're only going to be up for about 10 minutes or so. And you find a book there and you're like, Oh, I kind of wanted to check Twitter or whatever, but 
I know I said I didn't want to do that and this book is here. Inertia can be very powerful. <laughs> so, but anyway, you should go through your life like thinking what can be the positive triggers. And that, of course, requires you to know what activities you do want to engage in. And that can be philosophically kind of a challenge. Yeah, that's a good point as far as just sort of using our own internal laziness to our advantage in that sense. Exactly. Make it easy. Make it easy to do the things you say you want to do. Yeah, yeah. So one of the most interesting aspects of this whole thing to me, and it sounds like you're interested in it too, and it sort of sparked this whole project, was how we humans thrive off of connection and our phones sort of provide a watered down connection in a sense. So since writing this book, have you noticed that your personal relationships have been approved or impacted in any way from implementing some of this stuff? I would say yes, because I definitely had gone down the path of, uh, you know, texting. I mean, I still text more than calling for sure, but I was really getting in these like long text conversations with with friends and they just didn't really feel that satisfying. And it's just so annoying to have to correct your text messages. And I also was just spending so much time just with this device instead of with people. So one change was that I, I just have really cut back on the amount of time I spent texting, which is a good, it feels good or rather it feels not bad. which is (laughs) And then I had a more profound uh, experience where one day when I was taking a break from my phone, just, as a ritual that I like to do occasionally, I realized I was just waiting for time to pass. And I, my daughter was napping. I couldn't leave the house, but I couldn't figure out anything I wanted to do. And this gets to the the point I was bringing up before of you have to know what you actually want to do with your life. And I had this kind of existential you know, moment of being like, well, I'm just waiting to die. Like <laughs> I'm waiting for dinner and then I'm waiting to die. This is not what I want to be doing. And so I, I thought about things I said I wanted to do, but never got around to. And, thought of guitar playing as something I'd always said I wanted to learn more of. And so the next time I was online, I actually signed up for an in-person adult BYOB guitar class that I knew was taking place. And that was just an absolutely wonderful um, catalyzing moment in my life to introduce me to a whole new group of people whom I see on a regular basis in a really casual, fun context we're not best friends. We'll never be best friends, but we're just like adults playing together. And I mean that both in the sense of the guitar, but also just like playing, which we don't do as adults. Like doing something where the entire point is just to enjoy the experience in the moment is something we don't get to do enough of. That's so cool that something as simple as being more aware of not filling those gaps in that space with your phone led to something as awesome as learning an instrument or or playing a little bit more. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's something I think was really cool for me to realize is it seems so mundane to think about your your phone, just such a boring, I mean, not boring, but it's just like, it's just your phone, right? And it was very interesting to realize how quickly it could become philosophical and actually have effects that went far beyond just technology. I mean, yeah, the, the culmination of that guitar story is actually I then joined an adult choir, the same guy was doing, and then somehow, and I don't know how this happened, ended up having to sing a solo to Like a Virgin in front of like <laughs> 150 people, including many children who were taking guitar with the same teacher. And I won't say that was like a shining highlight of my past year or something I'd want to repeat, but it certainly would not have happened if I had not embarked on this project with the phone. <laughs> That's incredible. Did you get a standing O or how did that go? <laughs> no, no. I think I got... I got, I got, I got respect. Nice, nice. <laughs> Doing that, but it was not. Um, we, uh, we were all happy to move on. <laughs> that is so awesome. Oh my god. Now, uh, Catherine, as we as we start to wrap up here, where can folks find out more about your work, the book, uh, the thirty day challenge, which I'd recommend that folks check out, as well as your social handles and all that good stuff. Yeah. So, well, the book is How to Break Up with Your Phone, and the website for the book is phonebreakup.com. And I've put together resources there that I hope will be helpful to people, including the lock screen images I mentioned earlier, and also uh, resources like um, information about phones and kids and ideas with how to deal with that or educational resources. Um, And then there's a phone breakup challenge, which is a 30-day series of emails that are uh, times so that when you sign up for the challenge, the emails start, and it's meant to accompany you as you go through the book. And those are basically a way to keep uh, a more more interaction with the process and stay more engaged instead of just like reading the book and then putting it down and forgetting about it, which is what I tend to do with self help books. And I'm also hoping to um, 
to, well, I am launching a broader breakup challenge in January that's going to be more interactive. I'm still working out the details, but if people want to sign up for this current iteration, they'll get on the, the newsletter and then they'll find out about that. And then in terms of my general journalistic work, my previous book was uh, Vitamania, How Vitamins Revolutionize the Way We Think About Food. So that might be of interest to your listeners. And you can find out more about that at um, katherine-price.com. If you just Google my name, it's with a C. And lastly, uh, social media, I'm not on it that much, but I, Twitter is Catherine underscore Price. And I think my Instagram handle is the Jomo Project, but I, the fact that I don't know that should indicate that I'm not on Instagram very much, so I would go with Twitter first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, and the, and the Jomo, is that the joy of missing out? Is that what that stands for? The joy of missing out, yes, exactly. Oh, okay, cool. Well, actually, what, now that we mention it, can you explain that a little bit for us? Because I know you touch on it in the book. Yeah, so we all know at this point, or most of us know about FOMO, the fear of missing out, which is... I've been trying to figure out a definition for actually, and I think it's the anxiety that comes from not being confident in any of your decisions. So when you Mm. decide, okay, I'm going to this party. Ooh, but maybe I should have gone to that party. It's the grass is always greener kind of thing. But the flip side of that is the joy of missing out, which is being confident in your decisions or just confident with the fact that you can't do everything at once so that you can actually be present in whatever you're experiencing. And that can be very nurturing, um, and actually physiologically good for you because FOMO comes with a lot of stress hormones, as we were discussing earlier, this feeling of anxiety that you're just never quite living the life you want to lead or doing things right. And you're always missing out versus just deciding, taking more control over your own time and being confident that you can choose what's best for you and that it's okay if you miss out on some stuff. Because if you miss out on what's on your phone, you're going to have more time to do things in real life. Well, that's awesome. I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Awesome. I'll catch you guys on the next episode.